Ursula K. Le Guin's short story, The Rule of Names, is set within the Earthsea narrative universe that she's going to build out over decades. And there's a number of important key themes that are going to show up in the novels and other short stories that are being developed or at least referenced here in this story. It's also a great tale just on its own lights because we're getting to see, you know, kind of, it's almost like a detective story with a twist in the end as uh, we'll talk about in just a moment. So the first thing we encounter is this Mr. Underhill, who is a wizard, but not much of a wizard. He's a rather mediocre type. And he's not only mediocre as a wizard, he's also kind of, you know, middling as a man as well. There's this, you know, wonderful description of him here. Um, after we get past him, you know, huffing and puffing, uh, the villagers see him. And, and here's what she has to say. He was all the little island hand in the way of a wizard, and, and so he deserved respect. But how could you respect a little fat man of 50 who waddled along with his toes turned in, breathing steam and smiling? He was no great shakes as a workman either. His fireworks were fairly elaborate, but his elixirs were weak. Warts he charmed off frequently reappeared after three days. Tomatoes he enchanted grew no bigger than cantaloupes. In those rare times when a strange ship stopped at Satin's Harbor, Mr. Underhill always stayed under his hill for fear, he explained, of the evil eye. He was, in other words, a wizard the way wall-eyed Gan was a carpenter by default. The villagers made do with badly hung doors and inefficient spells for this generation. And they relieved their annoyance by treating Mr. Underhill quite familiarly as a mere fellow villager. And so, you know, what we've got here is this guy who clearly, you know, there's that old joke, what do you, you know, what do you call the person who graduates at the bottom of their medical school class? Doctor, he's a wizard in more or less the same way as she says, by default. He's the best that they've got to work with and that's it. He's shy, he doesn't look like much, you know, they, he, he puts up with them treating him in very familiar ways. His magic is kind of haphazard. A little bit later, uh, the, one woman relates a story about him curing a cat of the mange, but unfortunately the mange, if you don't know, is, is a disease that makes hair fall out. It's an orange cat and the hair that grows in is gray. And this is like perfectly representative of him. He's, you know, retiring. He doesn't like people delving into his stuff. And he, you know, he does his share of things, but he's just not very good at it. A little bit later, they describe him wanting to hang out with older people. He's shy a young, around the young men. And then we get this vignette where he is going along getting, you know, the stuff he's going to get at market and he runs into a school being taught. Now, everybody's basically illiterate on this island, so they're not using chalkboards or books or anything like that. Here we go. Uh, the school was being held this day out on the common. Since no one on Satin's Island, island was literate, there were no books to learn from and no desks to carve initials on and no blackboards to erase. And in fact, no schoolhouse. On rainy days, the children met in the loft of the communal barn and got hay in their pants. On sunny days, the school teacher, Polani, took them anywhere she felt like. Today, surrounded by 30 interested children under 12 and 40 uninterested sheep under 5, she was teaching an important item on the curriculum, the rule of names. Now, this is what the story is itself named after, the title, right? And within the Earthsea universe, the way that Le Guin is setting it up, names are incredibly important. And what we're getting here is, is peeling things a little bit like an onion. What is it that's so important about names? So she asks the students, what are the things governing these? She says, you know the rule of names already, children. There are two, and they're the same on every island in the world. What's one of them? 
It ain't polite to ask anybody what his name is, shouted a fat, quick boy, interrupted by a little girl shrieking. You can't never tell your own name to nobody, my ma says. Right? So we've got in the lingo of island children, two of the, you could call them sub rules of names. Don't ask, don't tell. Don't ask other people what their name is. Don't tell your own name to other people. Now, we have to make some qualifications here. Does that mean that everybody on these islands and everybody in the world of Earthsea wanders around not knowing who anybody is? No, because you have some other names, sort of like the, you know, the external thing. We could call them nicknames, if you like, as opposed to our given names. We're used to using our given names as our names. Although sometimes you, people may surprise you. They may have you know, a confirmation name that you never find out about until you get particularly close to them. You might not even know that they were confirmed and given a name, or there might be other names as well. So there are what we can call child names, right? The names that are given to children by their parents. They're going to get a, a true name later. Given names, prime example of that is Mr. Underhill. He lives under a hill. There you go. That's his name. Or Blackbeard, you know, the guy who sails in, he's got a black beard. There you go. Um, the other names like Bert would maybe be child names that just made it into adulthood because they're living in the same place, or they could be given names. And then we have true names. The name that is at the core of who you are. Here it gets a bit deeper. So they ask, you know, the children, is Mr. Underhill actually, is this his true name? And they say, no. And they say, how do you know it's not his true name? Because he came here all alone and so there wasn't anybody knew his true name so they couldn't tell us and he couldn't. Very good, Suba. Poppy, don't shout. That's right. Even a wizard can't tell his true name. When your children go, are through school and go through the passage, you'll leave your child names behind and keep only your true names, which you must never ask for and never give away. Why is that the rule? And this is where we get to the real rule of names. There are these external rules governing behavior, and then there is the deeper reality governing not just names, but things and power and magic. That is the reason, the cause, the why behind all of this. Mr. Underhill reveals this. Because the name is the thing, he said in his shy, soft, husky voice. And the true name is the true thing. To speak the name is to control the thing. Am I right, schoolmistress? And that is the correct answer that's being given to the children. When you possess the true name of something, you can control, you can even coerce, overmaster it. If it's a thing like a rock or a body of water or a tree, you can get that thing to do what it is that you want. You can bend it to your will. If it's a person or perhaps even a dragon or <laughs> some other sentient creature, you can force it to remain in its shape or to assume it's one true shape. So the name is incredibly powerful and there are ways that you can get it. We find out that one can in fact acquire a name, not just through say learning or being given the name, but through black magic that would reveal uh, somebody's name. So now the next thing to talk about is this reference to wizards, warlocks, and mages, because we have a stranger show up to town. We already have a wizard, right? But perhaps this guy is something more. Why? Because he's sailing in on a ship. There was only one man aboard the ship. Old Sea Captain Fogano, when they told him that, drew down a bristle of white brows over his unseeing eyes. There's only one kind of man, he said, that sails the outer reach alone, a wizard or a warlock or a mage. So the here's how Le Guin expresses it. So the villagers were breathless, hoping to see for once in their lives a mage, capital M, right? This is something really special. 
one of the mighty white magicians of the rich, towered, crowded inner islands of the archipelago. So being a mage is something more than being a wizard, more than being a warlock. What exactly it is, we're not being told. But we'll find that out in other Laguin stories, won't we? So let's talk about this guy, Blackbeard. He shows up. He seems to be uh, you know, a, a trader of sorts. He's got all sorts of stuff to sell and you know, he wants to acquire information. He's hanging around there for a while and he learns from the others telling stories about this wizard, this not particularly great and rather shy and retiring wizard, Mr. Underhill. We also get introduced to Bert, who is going to play a, a you know, interesting role in the story, particularly at the end. And then Blackbeard tells a story. So what we have here is the traditional trope of a story within a story that is revealing what this story is in fact genuinely about. And here's how it goes. So he says, hold on, Bert, I have a tale to tell you before we meet your wizard. It's a story that started 100 years ago and isn't finished yet, though it soon will be very soon. Now, that's a great prefiguration right there. It will be solved. It will be resolved very soon, but not quite in the way that the story is leading us to think. So he says, in the very heart of the archipelago, so this is Earthsea, right? The archipelago is the islands. Where the islands crowd thick as flies on honey, there's a little isle called Pendor. The sea lords of Pendor were mighty men in the old days of war before the league. Loot and ransom and tribute came pouring into Pendor, and they gathered a great treasure there long ago. Then, from somewhere away out in the West Reach, where dragons breed on the lava isles, came one day a very mighty dragon, a black winged, wise, cunning monster full of strength and subtlety and like all dragons, loving gold and precious stones above all things. He killed the sea lord and his soldiers and the people of Pendor fled in their ships by night. They fled away and left the dragon coiled up in the Pendor Towers. There he stayed for a hundred years, coming forth only once in a year or two and he must eat. So he goes on and, he, and Blackbeard says, that couldn't be endured forever, nor the thought of him sitting on all that treasure. So after the League got strong and the archipelago wasn't so busy with wars and piracy, it was decided to attack Pendor, drive out the dragon, and get the golden jewels for the treasury of the League. So a huge fleet gathered from 50 islands. Seven mages stood in the prows of the seven strongest ships, and they sailed towards Pendor. They got there. They landed. Nothing stirred. The dragon's gone. The bones of the old sea lord and his men lay about in the castle courts and on the stairs. The tower rooms reeked of dragon, but there was no dragon and no treasure. Knowing that he couldn't stand up to seven mages, the dragon had skipped out. They tracked him and found he'd flown to a deserted island up north called Udrath. They followed his trail there, and what did they find? Bones again. His bones, the dragons, but no treasure. A wizard, some unknown wizard from somewhere, must have met him single-handed and defeated and made off at the treasure right under the League's nose. So we've got this really interesting story, don't we? Dragon comes, kills the lords of Pendor, takes their hoard, a great you know, uh, fleet and magical army comes to get him. He's gone. He's skipped town. And then they track him down, and all they find are bones, but no treasure. So there must be a wizard out there somewhere who's got this treasure. Why does Blackbeard actually care about this? He says, I am the sea lord of Pendor, and I'm going to get this treasure. He says, there must have been a powerful wizard and a clever one, first to kill a dragon, second to get off without leaving a trace. I've got an advantage, you see. I have... The, I'm the descendant of the lords of Pendor. That treasure is mine. It's mine, and it knows that it's mine. I've got this you know, uh, staff that, that glows green, and the green, great emerald is calling out to me, and now I know where it is. And he says, I'm the sea lord of Pendor, and I will have the gold my father's won and the jewel my mother's wore and the green stone. They are mine. Now, what's being implied here? Mr. Underhill is that wizard. 
So Mr. Underhill isn't as incompetent as we have been led to believe. Instead, he is hyper competent. He could actually kill a dragon on his own and vanish without a trace with all of that treasure. So this is quite interesting. Is, is Underhill not the you know, kind of schmucky guy that we think he is? It, or maybe Blackbeard is deceived about that. So here's where Blackbeard invites Beard to see the end, to see the story brought to its conclusion. He tells him, here we go. You can tell your village boobies the whole story after I've defeated this wizard and gone, or you can come and watch if you're not afraid. You'll never get the chance again to see a great wizard in all of his power. So Beert follows him, and now we get the wizard battle. And there's this transformation that's taking place, and I won't run through all the transformations, but it is a battle not only of magic, but of wits, you know, uh, one comes forth as a, a lion, the other comes forth as a tiger. Tigers beat lions, right? One comes forth as uh, a fire, another comes forth as uh, a cataract of water, another turns into hills. Finally, Blackbeard pulls a trick and he, he says... Take any shape you wish, Mr. Underhill. I can match you. I want to look on my treasure. Now, big dragon, little wizard, take your true shape. I command you by the power of your true name, Yavoud. So the true name, right? Going back to the rule of the names, the name is the thing. The true name compels the true shape of the person. And Underhill stays there as the monstrous dragon. Now Blackbeard realizes that things didn't quite add up in the equation. So here we go. Bert could not move at all, not even to blink. He cowered, staring whether he would or not. He saw the black dragon hang there in the air above Blackbeard. He saw the fire lick like many tongues from the scaly mouth, the steam jet from the red nostrils. He saw Blackbeard's face grow white, white as chalk, and the beard-fringed lips trembling. Your name is Yavoud. Yes, said a great husky hissing voice. My true name is Yavoud, and my true shape is this shape. But the dragon was killed. They found dragon bones on Udrith Island. And here we get this wonderful line. That was another dragon, said the dragon. <laughs> and that was the miscalculation that Blackbeard had made. Turns out that Underhill was not an, uh, actually a wizard as such, but a dragon, a dragon the entire time. There was no wizard who came along and killed this amazing, terrifying dragon. The dragon just killed another dragon and left it behind or perhaps didn't even have any connection with it and took the treasure here. So that's the end of Blackbeard, right? And Bert, interestingly enough, we, we get a little vignette. He, well, I'll read this to you. It's, it's such a wonderful description. The fisherman got to his feet and ran. He ran across the common, scattering sheep to right and left and straight down the village street to Polani's father's house. Polani was out in the garden weeding the nasturtiums. Come with me. Bert, Bert gasped. She stared. He grabbed her wrist and dragged her with him. She screeched a little but did not resist. He ran with her straight to the pier, pushed her into his fishing sloop. The queenie untied the painter, took up the oars, and set off rowing like a demon. The last that Satin's Island saw of him and Polani was the queenie's sail vanishing in the direction of the nearest island westward. And the villagers are all like, well, this is a strange turn of events, right? Blackbeard's gone. I don't know what happened to him. And look at Bert and the school teacher have run off together. And then Mr. Underhill, Yavoud, comes out. The story ends. Mr. Underhill had decided that his true name was no longer a secret. He might as well drop his disguise. Walking was a lot harder than flying. And besides, it was a long, long time since he had had a real meal. And that is where the story ends with the effects of the revelation of Mr. Underhill's true name. All of these 
key ideas and themes collapsed into one moment and we're left to imagine what is going to happen to the island after that. But in the process of this, what we've gotten to see is what happens when wizards battle each other and make mistakes as well. We've gotten to see some vignettes of earth sea life on this little island of satin uh, satin's island with you know bert and and his school teacher that he loves also his his uh grandmother or, or you know the goody and we get to see something about the nature of dragons but most of all we get to see illustrated and explained to us the rule of names that the story itself is titled by. 